Okay, well, as the lady says, recording is in progress. Welcome everyone to the uh, first uh, evening lecture of our 2022 uh, session. Uh, first of all, I, th I think I should probably pass on apologies from our president. I think if I'm right in saying it's his birthday today. So he's, um, he's been invited to dinner, a family dinner for his birthday. So uh, Tom passes on his apologies um, and uh, uh, we'll, we'll see him again soon, I guess we can say. Um, as I say, welcome everyone, welcome to uh, 2022. Somehow 2022 seems a little bit like 2021 and that we're still all online. And I think the indications are everyone that uh, we'll probably see out this session of lectures uh, in the same format uh, as we are this evening. So uh, bear with us please uh, and we'll, we'll uh, I'll keep things going. So uh, this evening's uh, speaker is Professor Charles Wellman, Charlie uh, Wellman. And I was doing a little bit of, uh, as you do for these introductions, doing a little bit of uh, um, research this afternoon. And uh, I came across the, the lines that in uh, Charles's uh, research interest on his webpage, um, he says that in recent years, he has also extended his research to look back in time to examine a previously neglected research area considering the algal scum that inhabited the land before it was inhabited by plants. And I think anybody who's got the, um, the courage to say he examines algal scum um, uh, gets my vote every time. Um, I think that's a great line, uh, Charlie. Uh, and um, I, th I think we, we look forward to um, uh, a fascinating uh, topic uh, and, and listening to uh, Charlie speaking on uh, a lot of research that he's obviously engaged in. I think he said earlier that these are rather old rocks uh, uh, in his, uh, compared to his normal work, uh, He's got quite a Scottish track record, knows the Rhiney chart well uh, as, as well. So we're going to look into, uh, with uh, Charlie's help, the Scottish Torridonian, and uh, we'll get an insight, uh, I hope, into life on land one billion years ago. So uh, thank you, Charles. Take it away. Thank you. OK, um, yeah, thanks for inviting me. Um, My pleasure. Our pleasure. Thank you. Uh, first. Uh, I'm going to give a talk on the Scottish Torridonian rocks, um, but first I should explain how I ended up uh, working on these rather ancient uh, billion year old rocks. Um, so I actually did my PhD in the late 80s um, working on the Scottish Lower Old Red Sandstone. Um, I was in Cardiff University with Diane Edwards, who works on plant macrofossils, and John Richardson at the Natural History Museum in London, who works on the dispersed spores and the idea was to combine evidence from actual plant megafossils and plant my and the dispersed spores to try and understand better the origin and early evolution of land plants and this was largely focused on um scottish silurian and lower devonian deposits and i still visit scotland every year collecting through the lower old red sandstone um so Basically, if you look at a land plant, there's a moss here in the middle, a living moss doing its thing. Um, they have two fossil records. You can either get a fossil of the actual plant, which is called a plant macrofossil, megafossil, or the tens of thousands of spores they release are blown about by the wind, they fall into rivers, flushed into lakes in the ocean and so on. And we can dissolve up rocks to study these microscopic spores. Um, so really we have two totally different fossil records. Spores we find everywhere, megafossils more um, rare, and we can combine them together to understand the vegetation of the time. Um, so I spent a lot of time, these are some Scottish materials on the left. We have some classic Zostrophyllum plants from the lower old red sandstone. And those will be 10, 15 centimetres tall. So these plants were big, the earliest land plants. And on the right, an assemblage of spores um, from the lower red sandstone of Arran. Um, and we can see we get all sorts of different spore types with different plants producing different spores. 
and we can link them together by breaking open the sporangia and seeing which spores the plants produced. And this um, kind of links together the fossil records. Um, I was also lucky enough to be invited by N Nigel Truin when he um, started to reinvestigate the Rhiney Church. And it was, uh, I was there when it was uh, dug out, retrenched, and also the first borehole cores drilled through the sequence. Um, I was invited to study the dispersed spores. So what we could do is dissolve up the sediments from below, between and above the Rhiney Church. And we got these beautiful spore assemblages, which we could then link to the sporangia of the plants that produce them. So we could actually work out which spores were produced by those sort of wonderfully preserved plants in the Rhiney Church and say something about their ecology and so on. So everything was kind of uh, going along smoothly, and that was my research topic. Um, but then I kind of I fell into the influence of the devil incarnate um, in the form of Paul Strother from Boston College. Um, Paul's uh, an interesting career in that he started off doing a master's with Al Travers at Penn State University studying palynology, classic spore assemblages of the earliest land plants. But he then did his PhD with the famous Elso Barkhorn looking at the Gunflint Church and the materials from the origin of life. Um, so I used to meet Paul at various conferences and we discuss early land plants, but he always wanted to take me back to start thinking about what lived on land before the land plants, where they came from. And we kind of debated this for years and years, and we ended up writing various reviews of the terrestrial biota prior to the origin of land plants and so on. Um, now, Paul um, in the 1980s has actually come to the University of Sheffield to visit um, Charles Downey, um, very famous, uh, originally Glaswegian palynologist that uh, basically studied marine acrotarchs and other palynomorphs uh, throughout Earth history. And Charles, during his time, had actually worked on the Torridonian. Um, there was a kind of paper in the 1960s from Normova that suggested that she had recovered land plant spores from the Torridonian rocks at a billion years old, much, much earlier than you'd expect to get land plant spores. And Charles Downey um, had actually collected um, Torridonian material when he'd gone back to visit his family in Scotland. And he then responded to this by showing that these weren't spores of plants. They were basically algal um, material that lived on the land, um, the Torridonian rocks of non-marine. And in fact, if we look at the collections in Sheffield, Downey had collected all sorts of samples throughout his career from the Torridonian, uh, but never really worked it up. Um, and Paul Strother had gone to see Charles Downey and they discussed it, but it never really come to um, anything. So eventually, um, Paul dragged me up to the Torridonian and we decided to mount an expedition to try and collect some more material and try and understand what was living on the land plant, on the land surface and in the terrestrial environments, rivers, lakes and so on, before the land plants appeared. Um, so where do you begin? Um, obviously, the first place is you go to the classic memoir of Peach et al from 1907. And then you can see many of the localities are described here. And then, of course, you've got Stuart's um, Gelsoc uh, survey memoir, which describes his lifetime's career looking at the Torridonian. Um, so the Torridonian sequence is actually predominantly sandstone. And what we need, the only way you preserve microfossils is in mudstones and dark mudstones that are unoxidized. So essentially we went through um, Peter Tal and Stuart and with a marker pen marked everywhere that they mentioned black siltstones, mudstones, and then went around the Torridonian collecting these. Um, so this is basic uh, 
the, the Torridonian sequence. Here we have northwest coast of Scotland with the Torridonian exposed many, many localities all the way through. Absolutely fantastic sequence. Um, you have the sleet group on Sky, which you can correlate across to the main Torridonian sequence. And that unconformably overlies the Stour group. Uh, fortunately, there have been a number of dates from various uh, radiometric sources, and they date the Stour as older, about 12, 1,200 billion years, sorry, um, 1,200 million years, and the younger Sleet and main Torridonian sequence at about a billion years. Uh, these sequences are all um, generally interpreted as non-marine, they have classic non-marine sedimentology, and uh, they're hugely thick sequences um, that accumulate in the center of a continent, so I'll explain shortly. Yeah, so this is a diagram of a billion years ago from Stewart's uh, monograph, and he shows that we have a supercontinent at the time with um, Amazonia here, Baltica here, Laurentia here, and Scotland or Northwest Scotland in the middle of the continent um, here. And the Torridon group essentially formed from internal rivers that flowed internally towards the center of the continent, dumping huge amounts of sediment, uh, building up this seven kilometer or so sequence that we now see beautifully exposed in the Torridonian. So on the right from the um, uh, Geosoc Paleogeographic, Atlas from Kopetal, um, we see an interpretation of the Torridonian. And at this time, the rivers would have been very braided um, rather than meandering, channelized, because there's so little vegetation to constrain them. So when it rained, you would have these braided rivers, very loosely moving sediments around. Um, and when it was dry, the rivers would have, uh, dry, um, would have fallen away. So that's a kind of interpretation of this environment with all this material being deposited within the center, a basin within the center of this supercontinent. Um, the Torridonian has advantages in studying it. One of them is the fantastic coastal exposures and also the exposures in land on some of the hillsides, beautifully exposed. Um, massively thick sequence it's a great sequence to work on disadvantages are that it's spread for quite a long part of scotland and it's not always easily accessible you often have to go onto islands uh, to study sequences and so on um, obviously the weather can be great but can be difficult and often we hire boats to go to the islands and so on and they have to be cancelled and the other thing, of course, are the midges. And one of the first preps I ever made from the Torridonian actually had a midge in it. Um, I thought it was the earliest animal that had ever been found, but it's not. These things get everywhere. And I obviously hadn't cleaned my rock correctly. And <laughs> there was a, a midge staring up at me as I studied the material from the Torridonian. Um, so what I'll do is I'll briefly run through the main groupings of the Torridonian and explain what we studied and where and um, where we got material from. Uh, bearing in mind that most of the sequence are thick red sandstones, which are no good to us, we're actually looking for areas where you either got small lakes that deposited fine grain sediments or rivers um, actually sort of trapped a small bit of sediment in the overbank flow or, or some such thing. Um, so the oldest group is the Stour group, which unconformably uh, um, underlies the main Torridonian sequence. It's uh, 1.2 billion years old, it's been dated, and it's largely a sandstone sequence. But um, here it is here. But it does have some rather unusual horizons. Um, it's probably got what is the only what was described as one one of the only volcanic horizons in the Torridonian, uh, which has now been uh, interpreted as a, a meteorite uh, injector layer. So it, there's some kind of interesting um, sediments within there. It. 
you get this limestoney layer as well that's believed to be possibly a lake deposit but also has been related to the impact in uh, ejector um, and uh, so it's kind of a, a an interesting um, part of the sequence most of it is quite cooked and the palynology is pretty thin um, so actually cloud in germs preston cloud was a a famous guy that worked on the origin of life and so on from the States. Uh, in 1971, he published some material. You can see it's pretty grotty. And material we've managed to recover, again, is fairly grotty um, due to the, the rocks being fairly heated and having not much siltstone shell in them. Um, just to quickly step aside to mention how we actually get this material. Uh, what we do is we collect about 20 grams, that's all you need, of black shale that's unoxidized, and we dissolve it up over a couple of weeks, uh, firstly in hydrochloric acid, which takes out any of the carbonate, and then we put it into hydrofluoric acid, which takes out the silicate, the rest of the rock. Uh, hydrofluoric acid dissolves glass, so we need specialized labs. Uh, it's also highly, highly dangerous if you spill it on yourself. Um, so we have specialist panology labs. Um, anyway, we dissolve up the rock and what's left is the organic content. Uh, hydrochloric, hydrofluoric acid don't touch the organic content. And we sieve that, um, usually using a 10 micron sieve, and that gets rid of the fine organic material, but it retains um, cysts and other organic, um, other fossil material that's greater than 10 microns in size. Um, so these things we're looking at are generally about, eight, um, about 12 up to about 50 microns in size. Um, bearing in mind that a micron is a thousandth of a millimeter. So these are extremely small and we study them under a microscope we strew out them onto slides. You get literally tens of thousands of them per gram of rock. We put them onto a slide and we study them on the light microscope, like here, or we can put them under the scanning electron microscope. And occasionally we've actually picked individual specimens, embedded them, sectioned them, and studied them on a um, transmission electron microscope. And you can look at the wall structure. Right, so that's the um, Sarah group. Um, the next group is a sleet group of Western Sky, which potentially has some material that's slightly older than the main Torridonian sequence. But we can, the diabeg and a shaley formation at the top can be correlated, um, linking the two together. The problem with the sleet group on Eastern Sky is that it's been heated to uh, green schist facies. And when you heat these rocks, it destroys the organic material, it destroys the fossils. And there's basically not a lot in the sleet group. So it's a bit of a dead loss. Uh, we've collected it, but there's nothing there for us um, other than some really, really black burnt material. So most of the work has been concentrated on the main group of Torridon group. And Torridon group comprises the diabeg formation at the base, which unconformably lies on these gneisses and a, a really old paleo landscape, terrestrial landscape. And that's followed by the apple cross group, alt bear group, and the Kalik head group. Um, I must apologise for my pronunciation. Um, every time I gave a talk on the Torridon, um, Al McGowan, a uh, prominent Scottish paleontologist, is laughing in the background and comes to afterwards to tell me that I pronounced it totally incorrectly. <laughs> but uh, yeah, you'll have to bear with me. I think he's Kalich head of maybe, but uh, there you go. Anyway, um, the diabed group is a large black shell in places it was actually a lake at the base of the sequence and was exposed all the way through the torridonian and so we've collected it at dozens of localities and it's one of uh, 
the most important deposits because of this shell at the base. So you can see these thick shells here. And um, this is the sequence on Razé on, uh, near Brockle Castle. Uh, great sequence. Um, and we can just sample through these black shells. As I say, we take about a fifth size lump of rock, but then we dissolve up about 20 to 40 grams of it. And it's stuffed full of these fossils. Um, the sandier parts of the sequence yield nothing. Um, when we look at the, these black shells, uh, they've got incredible sedimentology. Um, so you can see these big desiccation cracks on the shells. So they've clearly been exp summarily exposed and dried out at times. Um, they're interpreted as lake deposits. So the lake fills up, it dries out, it fills up again. And we have these big desiccation um, polygons. But we also, when we look between these, have these smaller structures that are about half a centimeter across, um, kind of like puckered um, structures. And they're classic microbial mat type structures. So we think these were produced by microbial mats that lived on the lake floor um, and were probably dominated by cyanobacteria that photosynthesized the way in the shallow freshwater lakes. Um, here again, we can see the, uh, um, some of these structures. When it gets wet, you can beautifully see these ripples and you can work out the kind of depths of the lake and so on. There are raindrops, um, there are desiccation polygons, and there are also these microbial mat type structures. So immediately there's a hint that something's living in these lakes on the floor or the, the, the base of them. Okay, so I'll just um, move up sequence looking at the rocks. The apple cross formation up here is just made up of thick, thick red sands. They have all these really fantastic slump structures, large scale slump structures in them, really quite impressive. Um, we've found two or three shales that have been almost trapped within these big sandstones. And fortunately, they've yielded fossils. So they're extremely hard to come by. And we've gone through a lot of sequence, but you do find the odd shell within what is a predominantly 99% plus red sandstone sequence. And these are interpreted as basically the deposits of meandering rivers um, draining these sands into this continent, center of the continent. Um, the Alt Beer formation is predominantly sand again, but there's a few more of these shells. Um, this is a nice thick one on Summer Island. Uh, so you can actually get the tourist ferry there that leaves you there for an hour. You have to sprint across the island, collect and sprint back before it leaves you there for the night. But it's, it's worth it because there's very thick shells again that were collected and are full of microfossils. Um, these were described actually uh, back in the 80s. Um, by a group at, uh, in London that um, there was there were, as a PhD that was run and there's a couple of people that actually works on the, uh, these and uh, Zhang Zhuangging um, described um, some of the fossils and he, he interpreted them as all belonging to the same organism and as a life cycle. Um, we don't entirely agree with this. Uh, we think that a lot of these represent different organisms. Um, and I'll, I can explain the reasons for that later on. Uh, the final formation at the top is Kallic Head, um, which is really difficult to get to. Um, you actually have to get the boatman to take you across a lot of room, or it's a very long walk in. Um, there's a kind of independent community that lives there without electricity and so on, uh, but they have a boatman that will pick you up, it collects the mail, drug, take you across, and you can go out towards the lighthouse and collect the sequence. It's actually a sequence of cyclothems. So it's slightly different than the rest of the sequence. Um, and at the top, we have these big cyclothemic sequences and you can collect the shells through the cyclothems. Uh, now, this is quite interesting because actually in 1907, um, in the um, geological survey uh, book, uh, 
there's a picture of microfossils that were seen in thin sections from some phosphate nodules that were collected from Kalik head. And these are actually described by Jethro Teal, um, probably the first description of Precambrian fossils ever. And they were largely forgotten about. So they sectioned these phosphatic nodules, observed that they contained filaments, um, spheromorph circular fossils in groups and in clusters, but then really didn't take this any further and nor did anyone else. And um, it, it, it was a kind of opportunity lost uh, because it wasn't really until the 50s with the discovery of the Gunflin Church in Canada that people started to seriously study these kind of really early sort of evidence for life. Um, so it says, a fantastic little plate it's just tucked away in the back of that huge huge um survey monograph anyway the carlic head group you can study dissolve up the rocks from these psychothems and you, you find the fossils so that's where we got our fossils from we've uh, we've got um see we've got assemblages of fossils from right the way throughout the sequences um particularly the main toridum group and um, what I'll do now is just explain what we tend to find. So when we look at the lake sediments, particularly from the diabet group, if we dissolve these up, um, we actually get evidence of the fabric of the mats that were on the, uh, on the bottom of the lake. Um, and you can see this sort of organic goo that's run through with cyanobacterial sheaves. We also get bacteria, classic sort of um, circular and ellipsoidal bacteria, um, exactly the same as something like modern Euhalothesi, which actually lives in big bacterial mats at the bottom of these kind of lakes in the Sahara today, that these temporary lakes it form. And so we can see that we've got mat structure that's run through with bacteria. Uh, presumably the cyanobacteria are intercepting sunlight in the shallow lakes and photosynthesizing and perhaps the other bacteria are then feeding on the mats and so on. So we've got bacterial uh, uh, microbial uh, evidence for the mats. However, in the same preparations, we also, oh sorry, um, here's some more of those uh, cyanobacterial sheaves. Um, you get them in all sorts of combinations and um, forms. However, um, along with these bits of mat that have obviously survived the preparation process, we also get other individual fossils, and they're quite staggering in how diverse they are. Um, that, yeah, yeah, my concept of diversity. Um, some of some one of my colleagues once described uh, what we work on is sticks and balls. Um, sticks being the cyanobacterial sheaves, and the balls being these characters here. So generally, we're looking at single-celled spheromorphs which are basically uh, smooth um, balls. Um, however, we can see that some of them have inner bodies, some of them have little spots on the surface and these are sometimes attached to tubes and others have these predefined splits. Uh, they look like those kind of um, Pac-Man from the old game where they used to eat things and they've obviously split open and release the contents. Um, so presumably they're cysts of some kind of organism. Um, some of them have this intriguing striations that form these patterns. So there's the beginnings of kind of ornament on these. Now, if you go to equivalent age material from marine environments, you quite often get spines and so on on the um, and and um, very sort of rudimentary ornament on the spheres. But we don't tend to see that in these terrestrial deposits, but we do get these things like these lines uh, and so on. So this is beginnings of a kind of ornament. And I'll come back to this, uh, this, this particular character later on, um, and we'll see how we interpret these. Um, these are some of the forms that have inner bodies and the spots on the surface. And we get them in clusters as well. 
Um, some of them are simply clusters of spheromorphs. Others are actually enclosed within a kind of membrane. Um, so they're forming as a discrete cluster before being released. And some of the things we, we simply can't relate to anything modern. Uh, we get these flask shaped um, structures and quite a lot of them actually bend all in this manner. They always have this kind of rotation and some of them almost seem to have a lid on them uh, where it was obviously something lived in there that was later released. And for someone who works on very small things, this is a giant. Uh, it's probably up to about half a centimetre across. And it, it's obviously one of those ones that opens up. It's half of one of those. And we find some of these really quite big um, specimens. Uh, obviously, everything I've shown you from the spheromorphs upwards are probably eukaryotic. So before that, we had prokaryotes, bacteria in the form of the cyanobacteria and the bact little bacterial structures. But once you get above 10 microns or so, most things are probably eukaryotic with a nucleus and a proper properly complex cell. So we're looking at eukaryotic diversity. It's also living in the lakes along with the um, prokaryotic map structures. Um, these are quite enigmatic. We find bits of what are clearly structured. They have edges, um, material, um, and we don't know what this comes from. Uh, we've tried to gently process to see if we can get bigger uh, examples of these. Uh, but at the moment, they've eluded us. Uh, but it does seem that there are some other structures that are represented by these almost cuticles. And this again just uh, shows the type of things we find. What I wanted to point out here is that that's a specimen actually on a rock surface. Uh, so it's one of the kind of um, flash-like structures and you can actually see them occasionally preserved on rock surfaces. And we get these quite large, um, almost uh, phalloid structures as well on rock surfaces. And we get all sorts of combinations of uh, lines of attached spheromorphs, spheromorphs together with the spots in association with tubes and so on. It's very difficult to relate a lot of this material to anything living. So we've gone through all of the, the kind of world, the, the, um, the, the single celled eukaryotic world and very few of the, the material you can actually definitively say belongs to any of those groups. There's either not enough characters present to tell you what they are, we have to accept that we're dealing with probably things with fairly resistant walls. So we're probably only looking at the cysts in many cases. And it's not easy to actually um, simply relate them to the living world. But obviously, we're talking a billion years ago. So um, if we go back to Jeffro Thiel's uh, discovery of this initial material, I mentioned he'd found it in a phosphate nodule. And one of the very peculiar things about the black shells that were deposited in these lakes is right at the bottom in the diabeg and at the top in the calic head, you get phosphate nodules, um, discrete nodules, a phosphate that actually occurs just along single lamellae and in various forms. Um, and what you can do is take out these nodules and thin section them and uh, see if there are material in there, similar to the stuff that Till described. And about the same time we started working on this, uh, Martin Brazier from Oxford University also began work. And together uh, with a PhD student, Lila Batterson, uh, we started to work on thin sections of the nodules. And it's clear from studying lamellae, laminae, they go into the nodules, they thicken up that the nodules formed very early and weren't compressed. The rock was compressed around them. And when you section them, you can actually see three-dimensionally preserved um, organisms. And these, some of them have the spots, um, even be suggested these may be the shriveled up contents of the um, cell, the actual cell. Uh, they're probably not nuclear nuclei because they they 
occur in the middle, whereas nucleuses occur at the side, generally, in uh, eukaryotic organisms. So they're probably the shriveled up contents, cellular contents. But this is exceptional preservation, and it makes a torridonian basically a lager statin. Um, lots of lila cut up lots and lots of these um, nodules, and you can start to relate the organisms in them three-dimensionally preserved and exceptionally preserved to the things we find in the palynological preparations that are flattened. Um, so it really is a, a fantastic deposit. Um, and we published this uh, as some of the earliest non-marine eukaryotes. Here you can see this is um, the diabeg formation. And there you can see these lake deposits. And there you can see some of these nodules. They, they kind of uh, weather to a pale blue color. Uh, it takes a while to get your eye in because they're very black when they're fresh. But uh, the nodules occur everywhere and we can mine these out and then section them and you find these beautiful, this beautiful preservation. Uh, one of the anomalies is phosphate, as you know, is very rare in the kind of uh, fossil record because it's generally um, in um, low supply and life will use it up as soon as it kind of uh, gets released. So the fact that these lakes have enough phosphate to form phosphate nodules is somewhat of a, uh, um, it's a question that needs to be answered. Um, we suggested it that, that it may be due to the organic material releasing um, basically extracellular material, but that's a kind of working hypothesis. And uh, I'm sure there's a, a, a lot of uh, geochemists that would have different ideas of how you get phosphate forming in these lakes, in these nodules. Um, if you dissolve the nodules up, um, obviously you get the palynology, uh, but they're really quite well preserved because they haven't been uh, flattened and knocked about. Obviously very quickly these nodules form, so you get all these different tubular structures um, in association, which is nice to see. You can start to piece everything together. Um, so one of the most interesting things we found uh, that made the news quite recently was this uh, fossil here. And this one is very interesting because it clearly is made up of two different cell types. So all the other clusters are made up of single cell types. But here you have a structure where the outer wall is made up of these sausage shaped cells. cells. So it's kind of a layer of sausage shaped cells that fit together. And then in the middle, you have circular, or sorry, spherical cells. And um, this, is a, um, this is a diagram that uh, Martin Brazier drew um, after a couple of bottles of red wine one night when he was trying to work out what was happening with these things. And we managed to get it as a graphical abstract into a journal, which was uh, quite an achievement. Um, but what he shows is how the cells, you can actually see them differentiate because we've got in the nodules different stages of the ontogeny of this organism. And there you can see the single cells are all the same size. You then get some of them elongate into these sausage type shells, which migrate to the outside to give you this kind of differential adhesion. And um, what this enabled us to do was to look at how the earliest or the single cell, uh, sorry, the earliest multicellular uh, eukaryotes alive today, how they how their, their cells differentiate. And the thing we decided it was most similar to were, were actually holozoans. Um, so we put this forward as possibly an early billion year old example of the holozoan, which obviously lead to, that led to the evolution of multicellular animals. Um, I was kind of slightly disgruntled about this because having spent my life working on plants, um, the first time I published on anything remotely like an animal, all of a sudden the press get hold of it and the, you're on the news and so on. Um, and it just goes to show there is this plant blindness. <laughs> We're all interested in what we're, we're related to rather than what we eat, I suppose. Anyway, um, we 
pulled on board Dave Wacey from Australia, who took some specimens over back to Australia, where he has um, some incredibly um, complex kit that allows him to look and sec take sections through these um, nodules of the individual specimens. And therefore, we can kind of dissect this organism and work out what it really looks like. Um, and uh, what we actually found was this, this is some examples of where we can see the ontogeny of the organism. But actually, if we go back to when we dissolve up the rocks, if you remember this from earlier, this thing with lines on it, we actually think that that is the manifestation of this, where the sausage-shaped shape cells have fallen off of it. Um, they, they're not preserved. There's an inner layer preserved, and you can actually, they leave these marks on it, which is what, which is why that it appears so. And uh, so we think we've actually picked this up in its kind of a, palynological form, if you like, and obviously beautifully preserved in three dimensions within um, these nodules. Um, Dave's machine's are unbelievable, and you can actually see that um, the chunk there is where he sliced through it. Uh, he takes these sections and then puts it on a machine that kind of renders an interpretation um, of the actual organism. So these are the sausage-shaped cells. That's where the lid's kind of basically been taken away while you've sectioned it. And inside you can actually see the equidimensional cells forming this organism. Uh, he was also enabled to, to uh, sort of work out, try and work out how they're preserved by uh, studying the, the geochemistry by, by focusing beams on, on, on it. Um, something I'm not very okay with though. Right, so um, wonderful stuff in the Torridonian. Um, I think we, over the, so we first went there in 2008 and been going fairly regularly ever since. And just about every grey shell or phosphate nodule that's mentioned in Peach et al. or in Stewart's monograph, we I think we've collected. We've seen letter trips to all sorts of islands. Um, to go across and trample over them. Uh, this one was particularly interesting, of course, because it's Grunard, uh, which you're now allowed to go on to. Um, so we landed the boat here at the southern end on this beach. And I think that's famously where the goats or sheep were. And then we tramped all the way through to the exposure on this end, which is Calic Head exposure. Uh, only the second place you can see it, apart from Lot Broom, and so you can stare out from here across the water and see the calic head exposures and then collect them on the sequence down here. Incredibly hard going because obviously no one's been there and the, the, the heather and ferns are all up and it, it took a real tramp to get across. Uh, but there's again a wonderful sequence full of uh, fossils that we managed to collect uh, and come back alive. Um, the Torridonian, thus, is a really rare example of a non-marine deposit from a billion years ago. Um, there's hardly anything from a billion years ago that's been interpreted as non-marine. It's virtually all marine rocks. Uh, they don't seem to preserve that well. Um, so we've got the Torridon that preserved in the middle of the continent. But another place is the non-such formation, um, which is basically in the center of the USA, and it's a series of rocks um, that uh, are, are again, largely shells, they're lake deposits, but with sandstones. And we went across and collected those as well. And they are remarkably, they're, they're dated to a billion years ago, remarkably similar to those from the Torridonian. We have exactly the same cyanobacteria and bacterial sheaves. And we also have the same type of fossils. Um, what you'll notice is the beautiful yellow uh, diaphanous appearance of the non-such material. It was essentially deposited in the middle of North America and then had nothing else deposited on top of it and just lay there for a billion years um, un, un, undisturbed. And therefore, it's very low thermal maturity. And when we dissolve it up, the palynology is absolutely fantastic and we can see really clearly all sorts of 
different structures to these fossils. And we can see them in different forms from these sausage like um, uh, associations and so on. Uh, the only problem with the uh, non such is that there's no phosphate and no nodules, so no exceptional preservation. So although the actual palynology is slightly better preserved than that from the Torridonian and shows it to be exactly the same, we don't unfortunately have any exceptional preservation to make it a lagostatin as the Torridonian is. So we don't get to see, if you like, the soft tissues of these organisms preserved in phosphate nodules. Um, right, so to summarize, um, what are the Torridonian ecosystems on their ecology? Uh, we've clearly got lake deposits, and there are a number of questions. Um, the cyanobacteria form mats at the bottom of the lake, and they are probably the base of the food chain in that cyanobacteria are photosynthetic. Some of them may have been free living in the water as well. Uh, but then we've got all these eukaryotes. They could obviously be feeding off the cyanobacteria, the, the, the organic matter essentially that is produced by it. Um, but some of them could also be green algae that are photosynthesizing. And this is a debate that's kind of rumbled right the way through the Paleozoic as to whether acrotarchs are photosynthetic green algae, single-celled photosynthetic green algae, or perhaps not photosynthetic. Um, so we don't really know if our eukaryotes are benthonic, planktonic, nectonic, or a combination of these. We know that they are clearly eukaryotes because their size and complexity with inner bodies. And we now know through studying the um, exceptional preservation in the nodules that they include really quite complex um, organisms that are, are probably holozoans that have differential two different cell types and are start, starting to um, experiment with primitive multicellularity and complexity. And these organisms will almost certainly have been kind of ingesting or taking in dissolved organic matter or particulate organic matter that was uh, from the cyanobacteria. What the other eukaryotes are doing at the moment is sort of in between and open to interpretation. And that's what we hope, well, that's what we're always thinking about at the moment. We do have some clear river deposits in the Torridonian and they have a similar set of um, certainly eukaryotes and cyanobacteria. So it seems that the rivers, it's not just the lakes that have uh, life, but also the rivers. What about on the land, the actual land surface? Um, microbial mats in the lakes were obviously underwater for much of the time, but we do know that lakes dried out because we get the desiccation cracks and whether the mats died off and reappeared, um, when they, they were resubmerged, uh, we don't know. But the guess is that there were probably microbial mats on the land as well, as you get in modern deserts and so on, and even really quite harsh environments. And these are probably associated with rudimentary soils. Um, as soon as you get a microbial mat, you can start to bind together sediment that is derived from the rocks with the organic acids and so on, and you're also adding in humus and organic material. So if we go to a desert uh, uh, environment today, we can actually see these very thin millimeter thick rudimentary soils starting to develop below microbial mats. And this is probably what's happening on the land a billion years ago. Um, as I mentioned, the, there are very few deposits from the Precambrian that are non-marine, the vast majority are marine. And it's through studies of these marine deposits that people have looked at the first uh, bacteria and the first bacteria uh, um, that evolved into eukaryotes and kind of developed the story of life on Earth. And the assumption is often that basically life evolved in marine environments and it diversified in marine environments. The land was too harsh to harbour life, uh, bathed in UVB radiation and so forth. Uh, it's a desiccating environment whereas the, the ocean is 
is wet and there's no problem with desiccation and the water uh, filters out UVB. Uh, but we're kind of questioning that and wondered if it's possible that the primary radiation of eukaryotes actually took place in terrestrial freshwater environments rather than the ocean. Uh, we have to bear in mind that the Precambrian Ocean was a very different place than it is now. It's anoxic, um, sulfidic um, in, for, for, throughout large parts of it and probably not that beneficial to life on Earth. Uh, is it possible that freshwater environments, which would have been similar to freshwater today, slightly different dissolved gases because there's less oxygen and so forth, but essentially the same as freshwater today, is it possible that actually a lot of evolution of these major events with the origin of eukaryotes and the diversification of eukaryotes, could that possibly have actually taken place in terrestrial freshwater environments? So uh, the question we kind of asked, uh, or rather when Paul Strother dragged me back at the beginnings because I was interested in plants, he said, what was there before? I think we're beginning to think about what was actually on the land surface before. And it seems to be quite interesting. And potentially it's actually where some major evolutionary events took place. And Torridonian and Nonsuch uh, are starting to shed some light on this. Um, so when I kind of started out in this game, uh, everyone looked at the Cambrian explosion of animals. Um, you know, the, the ocean was teeming with life, but on land, there was virtually nothing. It's basically described in many of the textbooks as a kind of barren wilderness, wasteland with no life. Um, and it's only the plants appearing in the Silurian Devonian uh, much later that started the second carbon cycle. Uh, we would argue that this is wrong and the marine carbon cycle and terrestrial carbon cycle probably started about the same time through cyanobacterial mats. The Cambrian explosion took place in the oceans in the Cambrian, but there was life on land, be it microbial or algal scum, but that eventually uh, gave rise to the land plants. So what I would envisage based on today's uh, environments so are rivers, full of green algae and so forth, perhaps multicellular, microbial mats around lakes, possibly biological soil crusts on rudimentary soils, and maybe living within rocks in the in, in, as endoliths. You see these sort of green layers within rocks in the Antarctic, where there's actually ecosystems of microbes. And actually, um, another place where we recently found more evidence of this is in the late Cambrian early Ordovician of Oman, where we found some terrestrial deposits, and they have virtually identical uh, micro microbial biota to that in the billion year old tor Torridonian and non such. And it seems it's only a bit later, the mid Ordovician, that we start to find our actual land plants that start to exploit this habitat of. Um, the first primitive soils created by this microbial life, it probably evolved from aquatic green algae that gave us our first vegetation in the Ordovician. And that's where I'll kind of finish where I should have started, <laughs> or normally started. Thank you.